Welcome to the Should Have Bit More podcast presented by Gold Boys. Coming up on the show today, Reed Wallach will join us. We'll talk some college basketball, the smaller conference tournaments underway in full swing. We'll get his thoughts on that. March Madness, some big pictures as we are nine or so days away from having this bracket in our hands. Another couple of weeks, we'll get going with the start of the tournament. And uh, it's really, it's the best time of the year because once these day games start for the conference tournaments, that's how you know March has arrived. That's the time of year, uh, these few weeks where you just, you turn on a, the TV any point of the day, day, night, late night, early afternoon, and there are uh, multiple games on. And once you get to the conference tournament, these are all game sevens. And, and you can say, hey, it's not fair to the first place teams that wins these league. They should just go to the tournament. There's a lot of truth to that. But hey, these are, uh, th- these are fun games to watch. They're dramatic. They're exciting. They're fun to bet. They're fun to watch. Um, so a bunch of them started on Thursday, a bunch more underway on Friday. Thursday, we had uh, the Atlantic Sun con- uh, Conference continue with their semifinals. So we're into the finals with that one. The Missouri Valley tipped off. That's always pretty fun. That's uh, that's a good under tournament, too. Those games are usually low scoring. They play in that huge building, and it's just it's hard to shoot. Those teams uh, have trouble scoring. So those are good unders to keep an eye on. But other than that, West Coast Conference tipped off, Horizon League, uh, Patriot League, Ohio Valley, Big South tips off Friday, and then a few more Friday, SoCon, Summit, uh, CAA, uh, American East. So you get the idea. I mean, they're all smaller conferences. They're not big household names, but they are fun to watch. They're fun to bet. And next week we'll get the bigger conferences. With these with these combined conferences, with these more, more teams in these conferences, you don't get as many bigger conferences where you get the upsets. And that's really what you're looking for in the bigger conferences, because by the time you get to like the semifinals with say the big East, the big 12, and most of those teams are in, they're just playing for seeding. There's not a lot of juice. What's fun is when you get a bid stealer, like Oregon state, I think it was three years ago where they had no chance of getting in the tournament. Well, they got in the pac 12 and won that tournament. And when they went all the way to the, uh, to the eight, I think it lost to Baylor in the elite eight. So those runs are fun, but just from a betting standpoint, I would say this just a, a broad view. First half under is usually a way to go. You get odd start times. Sometimes these start games start early in the morning, you know, 11 a.m., noon local time. Kids' body clocks are off where they're just not used to playing this time of day, especially during the week. You get some empty gyms. You get some bigger gyms in some of these venues where it's just it's harder to shoot with the backdrop. So I like first half unders. I would say full game unders, but at the end, they just they seem to foul out because, hey, it's the end of their season. There's some desperation that kicks in. So I, I like to stay away from the full game unders, but first half unders – are a good way to play. You do see a lot of fouling at the end of the games that could push these games over. And of course, um, the overtime is is an, an under killer where look, I think it's like 7-8% of games go to overtime. So if you've been an under and you say, oh my God, my game went to overtime. That's a bad beat. It is, but you got to know that going into into the game. You got to take that into account that, hey, uh, that's that's part of the, uh, that's part of doing business when you're betting these unders. You're going to get a percentage of these games that do go to overtime, but fun time of the year, really fun time of the year. I can't, I can't wait for these games to get going and uh, getting some of these title games for these smaller conferences and uh, in a way we go before you know it, we will be underway in March madness. And once that happens, you blink and it's baseball season, it's NFL draft, NBA playoffs, and it is a fun time of the year. So we'll talk to Reed about all of these games, get his picks. I know he's got some picks, some sleepers. So excited to talk to Reed. He is really good with these quickly on football. We talked about this the other day. I'll revisit it because there's whispers. Now Russell Wilson's meeting with the Steelers, Steelers, uh, have interest. Wilson has mutual interest. Oh man. I, I know the question you're, you're going to say, what else do you want to do? There's no options. And it's a fair question. I would not go down this route if I'm Pittsburgh. It seems like Pittsburgh is very happy, very content to just go nine and eight every year, get their brains beating in the first round of the playoffs. And everyone can talk about how great of an organization they are, how good Mike Tomlin is at winning, having winning seasons. I mean, what's the goal here? You're not winning a Super Bowl with Russell Wilson. And Again, there's not that many guys out there who say, hey, let's just sign this guy and go win a Super Bowl. There's Patrick Mahomes is not a free agent. I understand that, but I don't know. I would take my chance with the draft and just keep firing on quarterbacks till I found one. Uh, Pickett's not the answer. Rudolph played good at times, but I, nobody thinks he's the answer. But Russell Wilson, who's a mobile quarterback who doesn't move as well anymore, uh, it's just, I mean, he's washed. He really is. And he did not have that bad of a year last year, if you look statistically, but they really had to babysit him. They had to take the ball out of his hands. They had to rely on the running game, try to play good defense. They played better when they, when they were asking Wilson to do less. Uh, and I just, I, I don't think he's a quality starter at this point of his career. I don't know that you bring him in as a backup. Anyone would want to do that because I think he's probably still good enough to start for a handful of teams, but not, not good enough to stand, start for anybody that's contending or has hopes of, not just playing for a Super Bowl, winning a division, playing in a conference title game, that kind of thing. I just, I would not go down this road if I'm Pittsburgh. Seems like they are very content with mediocrity and signing Wilson 
guarantees you mediocrity. You can say, hey, he's an upgrade from last year, and that's all we're trying to do is upgrade the position. Eh, I get it, but I would not go down that route. Um, but it seems like that is possible. I mentioned the other day, Cousins to Atlanta is possible, if not likely, haven't gotten any rumor of that. Uh, and that's another thing that usually coincides with these conference tournaments or the start of March Madness that first week is when you get these big free agents uh, announcements. So we'll find out sooner or later where Cousins is going, where Wilson's going. No word on Fields. I don't know if the Bears will just hold on to Fields until the draft if nobody wants him and say, hey, we have this asset. We're not going to panic and just give him away. Hopefully somebody whiffs on a quarterback in the draft. I don't know that they'd hold on him until training camp and hope somebody's quarterback gets hurt. Then you could trade trade him. Uh, I just I don't think these teams, I don't think there's a big market for Fields because he's entering year four. He's an okay quarterback. He has moments, but he's not good. And you're going to have to pay him. He's going to want to be paid like a starter if you – play him as a starter. And that that's a lot of money. That's 20 something million dollars a year. And these teams are not going to want to do that. So the the market seems very, very limited for fields. So maybe cousins to the Falcons, maybe Wilson to the Steelers fields, who knows as we get closer to the draft, but man, I would not do that. If I am Pittsburgh, I just, I would not do that. You got Burrow in the division. You got Lamar. Uh, Cleveland's got a good team. I am not going to bring Russell Wilson to the table. Like, again, could you be, uh, they, they seem to have this habit of being seven and eight, being eight and eight. And then these other teams, they play like, they're, they rest the final week or their starting quarterback is hurt. And then Pittsburgh steals a spot and goes nine and eight. I mean, they have not won a playoff game uh, basically in like a decade. I think 2016 was the last year they won a playoff game. So it's been a long, long time since they won a playoff game. And I know everyone loves Tomlin and he's rah, rah. He's good in the media. He gives good quotes, but they have not done anything in a long time. And you say, Hey, they haven't had the team he's overachieved. And there's some truth to that, but he had some really good teams with Roethlisberger, Antonio Brown, Le'Veon Bell, that, kind of underachieved too i mean he won the super bowl his first year in 2008 and i think they only won he's only won three or four playoff games in the 15 or 16 years since so i don't know that i'm going down this road if i'm pittsburgh but between arthur smith and russell wilson and mike tomlin uh, I, I will be looking to bet it under next year maybe this is the year where they finally have a losing season and again just because you have a winning season doesn't mean you have a successful season if i'm a Steeler fan I'm, I'm tired of spinning my wheels i'm tired of either missing the playoffs or making it and having no chance in round one. I mean, there was a year where the chiefs buried them in round one, the dolphins killed them in round one uh, a while back Buffalo. They weren't competitive against Buffalo this year. I mean, just cause you get in the playoffs doesn't mean you're a contender. So strange move. I get it. You're, you can say, Hey, it's a name. We're upgrading the position. He's better than Pickett. We don't have a lot of other options, but I, I would not go down this road if I'm uh, if I'm Pittsburgh, but that's the football, the college basketball is in full swing. We will discuss that more with Reed Walk. That is next. This is the should a bit more podcast all right we are back should a bit more podcast excited to catch up with my old friend reed wallach from bet sided the early read podcast reed what's up man happy march happy march happy march well happy to be back on the podcast very busy time of the year but a great time of year as we're recording this we got some day ball on and that's always uh the best part of march there's games on at all times and uh you know just trying to uh enjoy uh a bunch of 18 to 22 and probably now 25 year olds uh, trying to put a ball in a hoop. And we will go through these just so people know, like we're recording this Thursday afternoon. We're going to do our best. It's it's tough with the turnaround time. I know people aren't going to listen to this Friday morning, Friday afternoon, maybe Friday evening. So we're going to do our best to try to keep everything in contest and not uh, date everything again. It's not always easy, especially with just games constantly. We'll do our best just uh, in general. As you head on, forget the conference tournaments for a second. The last regular season weekend for these big conferences, is it a stay away from you? It's a little like week 18 of NFL where, some teams, maybe they're just mailing in. Some teams are playing for a lot. How do you approach the final weekend? I definitely try, at least in earnest, when I circle, <clears throat> excuse me, when I circle my spots, like where I'm going to target, I'm going to try and go in with, all right, if this was a week in, you know, mid-January, how am I feeling? Like, you know, if it was a normal week and then maybe I do some sleuthing around, is there maybe a look ahead, like team has already clinched the conference title or they've clinched their spot, uh, in their conference tournament, maybe there's less of an incentive for teams to go all out. I definitely think that could factor into some of the handicapping um, when it comes to this weekend specifically. Of course, you have like senior day also. Uh, so, yeah, definitely part of the handicap of what you're doing in the final week of the regular season. Um, but I definitely try to, you know, comb through the games as if it was normal, at least early on and then, you know, circle back and see what's going on. All right. We'll just go rapid fire through these. You can tell me if you have a play. Uh, or if it's just there's no value and I'll just I'll start with Missouri Valley always a fun tournament get a lot of unders man I don't know if it's the big venue it's just the style of the teams but it, it is conducive to unders Indiana is the short shot plus 160 at DraftKings 
Um, take it away, whichever direction you got in, in terms of this tournament. Yeah, I uh, I took a flyer on Belmont. They're playing this afternoon against Valparaiso, who is like far and away the worst team in the conference. So if you're listening, I guess I'm either really, really wrong or they advance and like the real handicap begins. Uh, Belmont, if you go through January 31st, they actually played Indiana State on that day. But that's about a 10-game sample for pretty much all the teams in the Missouri Valley. Belmont's actually the best team somewhat schedule oriented, but they were the best offense and that kind of grades out. They slightly outpace Indiana state. Uh, they are on the same side of the bracket as Indiana state. They led the Sycamores who are um, I think every social account on a college basketball Twitter's uh, pining at or chomping at the bit for Robbie Avia to make a tournament. A cream Abdul Jabbar is what they're calling him. I think Belmont's a really tricky matchup for them. I think they could outpace them from three, Belmont, like I said, this is the best team in the MVC over the last month or so. So, again, I'm 19 to 1. They can shoot over Northern Iowa's pack line, who they would get in the quarterfinals, assuming they beat Valpo. And then it's that matchup against Indiana State. They led Indiana State by 16 in the first half without their leading scorer, Jacoby Gillespie. So, I kind of think you could see Belmont catch a little fire here. I also, if it's not Belmont, uh, I think Drake's a pretty miserable matchup for Indiana State as well. So I would, I actually, I, I think these like Indiana State chalks, uh, no thank you. I would prefer a, a flyer on Belmont or take in what, like 250 with Drake. I think Drake's side of the bracket is much more, you can navigate it much easier. West Coast Conference. Should we just fast forward to a Gonzaga St. Mary's final right now? Yes. Has that been and- the final for the last, tw- when was the last time they didn't meet in the final? Maybe one year they met in the semis? I'm just trying to think. I could, I could, of course, look this up, but it seems like every year these teams face off. Yeah, and honestly, usually Santa Clara, San Francisco, those teams are a little bit sharper. Not as much this year. San Francisco, I think, is kind of like fake goods anyway. They kind of just beat up on the, the bottom part of the conference. Gonzaga, I think, is an interesting opinion. This like isn't necessarily like West Coast Conference related, but just Gonzaga in general – Flying up the boards, starting to look like an like a they have the profile of a team that can make a run. I do think they're turning into something, but a lot of that might do with the fact that they were a poor three point shooting team for much of the year, and they just shot forty percent from three over the last ten games. So, like, is that what this is? You know, are they really that good, or are they just running really hot from three? Something you need to keep in mind because Gonzaga. They don't have a lot of three-point shooters. I don't believe anyone on their team outside of Nolan Hickman has made like more than like 53s or something this year. So this isn't a perimeter-oriented team. So when you're shooting 40% from three and you're not relying on it, it's a pretty nice thing to have in the bucket. So keep it on Gonzaga. I think you're going to see a lot of people fl- like go to them in the tournament. I haven't made up my mind which way I stand with them, obviously, bracket-dependent. Horizon, the short shot is Youngstown State 2-1. to one. I know a lot of people like Wright State plus 320. It was a very good offense. Uh, what are you looking for in this tournament? So this, again, we're recording Thursday, so this might all be for naught, but Purdue-Fort Wayne was a team I took a shot on uh, in the Horizon. The Horizon League, I got to pull up, but over the last 10 years, I believe the one seed has only won like four or five times, and like the five seed has won three times. So like this is a conference that gets crazy pretty regularly. Uh, so Purdue-Fort Wayne is a team I took a shot on. At 14 to one to win the tournament. By the time you listen to this, if they're still alive, it will be not that. But Oakland, who is the one seed, was about the third choice in the market. So this like isn't a it's not an Oakland team that is um thought of very highly in the market, I should say. So I like Purdue Fort Wayne. They are the best team at protecting the ball and also turning opponents over. Uh so I think that they could cause a little bit of havoc. They also shot very well over the last month. So Purdue-Fort Wayne, I think, in the horizon is a team that can get going on both sides of the floor. They also rank inside the top fifty, uh, top 55 in Haslam metrics away from home rating. This is kind of a good, good rule of thumb with conference tournaments. Teams that can play away from home, most of these tournaments are on a neutral court. Uh, teams that could travel, it's going to pay off. Uh, hint, hint, wink, wink, Alabama and Auburn. Uh, teams that can't go on the road, probably going to struggle on these neutral site games. So... Uh, Purdue Fort Wayne has done well all year on the road. So I think this is a team that can maybe catch some fire, but honestly, there's a lot of teams in this conference that could, like this one is probably, you're going to see like the four versus the seven seed come, you know, the finals. So don't be surprised if this one like looks wacky when you're looking at it from a like box score perspective. 
How about the Patriot League? Colgate has dominated this conference in recent years. I don't think it's a vintage Colgate team. We think of them and they're just they're always good on offense. They get to the tournament and they struggle because they try to play fast. They try to outscore teams. They just don't have the athletes. But I don't know. A lot of people think this Colgate team is vulnerable. They are minus 250, like I mentioned. I know some people like Lehigh around 10, 11 to 1. BU is, yeah, 6 to 1, the second short shot. Anyone you take a stab at or is this just Colgate's to lose? Not much of an opinion here. Colgate, like, is such a massive fear, but also, like, this is it, it, a lot of these conferences, they have a unique setup to them, like Horizon League. They reseed Patriot League. It's all at Colgate. The number one seed hosts the entire tournament. So, uh, you know, are you going to count on a team in Colgate that hasn't lost at home? Or they lost one game at home in conference play on January 10th to Lafayette by five, but they were able to beat Lehigh by a couple baskets. That's probably why a lot of people are flocking to them. Like, if you want to take a flyer, sure. But I, I didn't have much interest here. Colgate, justified favorite. Like, I don't know if the if the number is going to match, like, the upside for some of these teams. Ohio Valley, Moorhead's the short shot, right around even money. And then you got Little Rock and UT Martin, anyone you like here. Yeah, I I didn't bet it myself, but I, I think Little Rock is being a little slept on. Moorhead's a pretty, uh, you know, we're talking close to pick them. And I'm sure they um, have been probably the most talented team on paper, but – uh, I wouldn't sleep on Little Rock. This is a team that uh, they shoot the ball really, really well when it comes to a matchup against Morehead State. They beat them in the lone matchup by one. Again, they haven't lost since, uh, since February 1st. I think, you know, I, I'm a little surprised that there's so much love for Morehead State in this uh, conference. Again, I didn't bet it myself, but um, I lean towards uh, Little Rock here if I had to, you know, throw a dart on something. Yeah, everyone loves Moorhead. Uh, how about the SoCon? High point, minus 120. They are the short shot, obviously. Not too many of these minus money. I guess there's a few, but uh, Ashall right behind that. Winthrop, Gardner-Webb, any interest in this conference, in the SoCon? Yeah, um, on my podcast, I discussed uh, with my guest, Matthew Winnick, and he kind of sold me on uh, Gardner-Webb as, I think, they're like a third or fourth choice. Yep, fourth. Uh, they've... Yeah, they've given UNC Asheville a lot of trouble. High point, uh, really talented team. Uh, play a up tempo style of ball that isn't really conducive to a, you know, four games and four nights type of setup, three games and three nights type of setup. So uh, Gardner Webb is a team that can beat anyone on the right night. They've kind of shot the crap out of the ball for the last month or so. So keep an eye on Gardner Webb if you're looking for like a longer shot in the Big South Conference. And that was, like you said, the Big South. This is the SoCon. I always get those two yeah. confused, SoCon and <laughs> South. But the SoCon, uh, Sanford is a pretty good team, plus 150. And then Greensboro and West West Carolina, uh, Western Carolina right behind that. Is it chalk or somewhere else you go here in the SoCon? I like Greensboro. I bet them okay. uh, 450. Is that still available? Yeah, I've got, I'm looking at four, plus 425, but that's only one book. I'm sure if you shop around, you get a little better, yeah. which is key with these conference tournaments because it's not like – you know, the Packers play the Cowboys and the Lions minus three everywhere. You get a lot of discrepancy in these prices if you shop around. Yes. So UNC Greensboro, they are my pick to win this tournament. I like their side of the bracket a lot more. Uh, really, really good guard play here with Kobe Langley, with the Langley brothers. They are a top 10 three-point shooting team. Uh, so there is a little bit of variance here, but I think their ability to slow down teams on this like neutral floor setting can really, really set up for a good tournament run. Whereas Sanford, on the other hand, Really talented team, 100%, like really great year. They went 15-3 and three in the conference. They also play at like a frenetic tempo where if a team is able to make them operate in the half court, all of a sudden the game gets a little bit dicey. Greensboro, they're a little bit more comfortable playing slow, but also being sped up because they could shoot as well. A lot of variance in this conference. I could see Sanford getting bounced pretty early where I think Greensboro plays a little bit more sustainable basketball. Again, with their really good guard play, guard play wins in March. So I kind of found myself going towards that Greensboro side. I mean, they closed the season on a bit of a cooler. They lost two of their last three, but I think this is a team that's ripe for a, a pretty decent run here in March. America East, this has been Vermont. They've been a dominant program for a long time, going back to, uh, what was it, 2005, the Taylor Coppenrath? Here, boy, hard to believe that's 20 years ago or so. But this is a a, a team that, that's been dominant. They've been a good team. Uh, they are the minus 250. Lowell's 3-1. to one, Bryant plus 850. Is it chalk? Is it pass? Anything else you like in this conference? It would be chalk for me. I wouldn't lay the price, but I just think there's such a gap between Vermont and all these teams. Like, I would say... Colgate, for example, like I don't know how to gauge that drop off in talent, but to me, Vermont is just such a cut above these teams. And I, I've 
bet on Vermont a handful of times. I've faded Vermont a handful of times, uh, much to uh, my wallet going awry. But um, this team, they play super slow. They don't make mistakes. I just think that's what you're looking for, especially in a tournament like this. I don't know about like if they're like the 14 seed playing like a really talented three seed. But when you're playing in a limited conference where you have the most talent, the fact that they're 14th in the country in terms of turnover percentage, they could shoot the ball at a pretty decent clip from the perimeter, but also get inside and really uh, generate some easy buckets. Um, Florio, their big man, or Fiorolio, I'm sorry. He didn't play in their last game. I'm pretty sure that's just because they were sitting him because they already clinched the one seed. Um, Keep an eye on that, I guess. But I think Vermont is a worthy favorite here. But again, you don't want to lay like a minus 250. It's just not worth it. There's better uh, uses of your money there. Summit, South Dakota State, plus 130. They are the short shot. Any interest in the Summit here? You know, this is a conference where I've really stayed away from all year. It's just one where I don't have a good feel. You know, I, I could only go so far, whereas some of the other mid-majors I have been interested in. Uh, this is one where the games are really crazy. I'm just like not super interested. So a pass for me altogether. I'm sure the finals are going to be played in the 90s and it's going to be a really entertaining brand of basketball though. Yep, I uh I would agree with that. Let's see. We've got uh the coastal here. Oh, the CAA. Charleston's the short shot, plus two twenty-five. Hofstra's plus two eighty. I'm rooting for Hofstra. They haven't won, they haven't been to a tournament in a long time. The one year they won the conference tournament, they uh it was the COVID year, so they didn't yep. actually go to the tournament. That was actually like the night before, two nights before, right around four years ago now, where the world that. just shut down and that was just cruel. So I'm rooting for Hofstra plus two eighty. I actually think they're live in this. I like their team. Do you have any opinion on this tournament either way? Hofstra was the team that caught my eye. I didn't bet it myself, and it's been kind of been bet down. I'm a little concerned that Charleston is really rounding into form. This is a team that went to the tournament last year with a blistering offense. If you kind of go through their recent results, this is a team that's starting to look like it. I mean, they're uh, this is a top 60 offense, but they haven't lost since a, a tight home loss to Wilmington on February 1st. Uh, that's what, eight in a row for them. But it's also the manner in which they're starting to rip off wins. Uh this offense far and away the best in the CAA. They shoot 37% from three, but they're able to score inside with their big man, uh, Bursevich. I think that this, uh, and they just beat Hofstra by double digits at home uh, last weekend. I think Charleston, worthy favorite. Maybe if Hofstra gets them, maybe I'll take the points with the pride in a game like that. But to me, this is a stay away. I think that the CAA is like Wilmington. I think people are going to be eyeing after Charleston beat them in the conference title championship game, maybe in overtime, uh, it was a tight game down the stretch. Uh, where are they? No, they won by five in the championship game against Wilmington. But I think Wilmington's out of gas. They did not close the year the way many had thought. They were trading a lot of uh, wins and losses down the stretch. So I don't like Wilmington. It would be Hofstra if I'm taking a shot off of Charleston. And then the final one, I think Big Sky, Eastern Washington plus 200. This starts Saturday. They are the short shot. And you got Weber State, Montana, not that far behind. Uh, then Northern Colorado. Any interest in the Big Sky here? Uh, not. This is another one where I kind of stayed off this entire season. But I will say Northern Colorado, just this is a team that the offense is Really, really efficient. Uh, second in conference play, an effective field goal percentage. They shoot both inside and out. The defense don't make mistakes. They do a good job of limiting to one chance. So maybe a flyer on Northern Colorado, but it's not one I played myself. Did you have a favorite bet of the bunch? If people are like, oh, I'm not going to play all these. I just want to play one. What's your favorite one? Like, I think Belmont can really wreak some havoc, but okay. that's like a, a little variance driven. Uh, I do think Greensboro, though, it should be closer to Sanford on the opposite side of the bracket. They are the two seats. So I like their path to get to the championship. And then I like how they match up with the favorite Sanford. So I would say Greensboro at around like four fifties, probably my favorite, but like if you're, I think Belmont can maybe spoil some, uh, some Indiana state love just with the way they match up with the Sycamores, especially. So, I mean, that's a longer shot. Uh, hopefully they beat Valpo. So when people listen, they could uh, maybe get in on it. Big picture, UConn is the best team and they're the best team by a significant margin or it's not as wide a gap as most people think? No, I, I think UConn, like if I had to pick one team to win it all, it would be U, like odds independent. I would say UConn's the best team. I don't think I'm breaking any news there. I think it's pretty interesting. I think Tennessee is the second best team in the country. I bet on this team to win it all in January at 22 to one. Congrats to me on uh, the CLV, but I, I truly believe that this is the second best team in the country. I think Houston is a fairly flawed team. They're also banged up. This is a Houston team that's running out of bodies really quickly. Uh, Purdue, 
I think it's very Zach Eady reliant. I think that, you know, maybe they have the best player, most dominant force, but all it takes is one game where the reps are letting them play a little bit or Eady picks up two quick ones. All of a sudden, this is a different team. And then Arizona, I think Tennessee's just a better team than Arizona, just point blank. So I think Tennessee is the second best team. Look, does that mean they're going to win it all? No. But I do think when that bracket comes out, like I'm not, I, I've been a known non believer in Rick Barnes come March. I do think this team's a little bit different. And I, I'm a believer in them. I think that they absolutely can go to the final four and win it all. Any team that you have in mind, like, hey, when the bracket comes out, I can't wait to bet against them. Or when the tournament, when the bracket comes out, I can't wait to bet on them. Do you have any t- teams in mind that are either overrated or underrated? Yeah, I, it's a lot of SEC teams. Alabama and Auburn, I'll probably be betting against at a pretty, you know, at, until they're bounced. Obviously, this is matchup dependent stuff, but those are two teams that just thrive on their home court. They're completely different teams on the road. So those are teams, if they could, maybe not the mid-majors in the first round because, like, they'll have so much more athleticism that they could run them off. But, like, second round, give me a competent opponent that could handle the ball and handle some pressure. They'll just absolutely carve up those defenses. So Alabama and Auburn are probably dead fades for me. I would be absolutely shocked if they make runs. Um, From, like, the middle tier, I'm a little interested in Florida. I think that this team has been competitive all year. They're playing their best ball now. You know, you kind of look at their losses in SEC play. Uh, They started one and three, right? Since then, they're what? One and three. They're 10 and three since. And their losses were at A&M in a really crazy game. They led most of the way. At Alabama in overtime where really it's been impossible to win there. And then at South Carolina where they led most of the game as well. So sure, like I'm talking home road. You got to be careful. But I think this team has size. They could shoot the rock. They play good defense. I like their coach and Todd Golden. So I think Florida has some upside. What are they? Like on like the sixth line? Probably. I agree. I think that'll be a trendy one. I I could see Florida uh, obviously match up. But like, I think that's a team. Again, when I'm looking at like, okay, I'm trying to project into the future. And I'm trying to see who can make a run. I want teams that can win in multiple ways. Team that can win grinders. Teams that can win high scoring affairs. Florida looks the part to me. And it's why I like Tennessee as well. Cause Tennessee has proven it's balanced enough where it could win in different ways. Like Houston. I'm not sure come tournament time, that offense is going to translate to a high scoring affair. It's how they got bounced last year against Miami. So I think Florida is an interesting team peaking at the right time. Just another note on Tennessee real quick. I'm praying they get bounced early in the sec tournament. I want them out. I want Dalton connect on ice. I want a nice little breather because this team, they're home for Kentucky on Saturday. I don't know if they're going to go full throttle, but I imagine they're going to win. They're going to be a huge favorite. But um, even if they win or lose, they've won one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in a row against quality competition too. I'd love for them to get like a quick loss out of the way, get an extra time off and like really get some extra time to prepare for the tournament. Yep, it makes sense. And you go back and you look at teams that win the NCAA tournament. And there's at least top of my head, there's no rhyme or reason in terms of like correlation between how you do in the conference tournament and the NCAs. I know some coaches take it very seriously. Some I think if you gave them truth to them, say, hey, I really don't want my team playing three games in three days, four games in four days, then have to turn around and play Thursday or Friday in the tournament. And so I don't know. Have you found the same thing where it's like, you know what? Sometimes you take the conference tournament. Look at UConn last year. I think they lost in the semis to Marquette. They turn around and they bury everyone in the NCAA. So I, and there's not always a rhyme or reason for it. Yeah, there's usually, this is more anecdotal than anything, but there are usually, there's usually some, I should probably look into this, but there's usually some truth to like, you don't want to like blow your load the week before the tournament. You know, right. you don't want to be, like hitting on all cylinders against your conference tournament because, you know, you celebrate, you cut down the nets, you know, it's a big thing. You play a lot of games. You play what four or five games in that many days, you know, you celebrate. And then all of a sudden you got to turn around. You're playing a completely foreign opponent across the country on a fairly quick turnaround. You know, that doesn't necessarily suit well. So I do think, listen, it's not like, Oh, dead fate. If you win the tournament, it's just like something to keep in mind when you're thinking about it as uh, the next week goes down. NBA, last one before we get you out of here. Are we looking at a Nets? Oh, I was not sorry. I said, Definitely not oh, Nets. You slip. Uh, because you're a Nets fan, and I don't know if you want to talk about the Nets. I wasn't going to do that to you. Uh, are we looking at a Nuggets Celtics finals as much as it's competitive, it's balanced? Are we are we just kind of sleeping on the fact that hey, it's probably going to be these two teams in the finals? Yeah, probably. I do think though the the, the thing with Denver, I think for sure. I think the road still goes through Denver. I think Denver's gonna get the one seed, and I think that they're gonna end up oh, in the finals yet again. Boston, 
I think they're going to win a lot of games. And I think that they're going to be the one seed and they're going to be heavily favored. It's just the playoffs are so different. I really wish Embiid was healthy because Philly was my opinion. This was their year to get over the hump because I think Milwaukee is flawed beyond belief. I think Boston still has some really fatal flaws on their roster. So that was a situation where I was like, I'm still going to look for like a way to get against Boston. I just don't know who it's going to be like. Miami's playing great ball. Maybe it's them. I can't really get there with Cleveland. And now they're banged up again. Um, Milwaukee, I'm never betting in the playoffs. So like, yeah, it's probably Boston, but like, I'm not going to like lay a short price on Boston to win the East. I just think things could still go sideways with that team. I agree. It's just, man, it, it, they, if a team ever had a red carpet to the finals, I mean, unless you want to say Miami can do it again, which maybe they can, like you said, Embiid's hurt. The Knicks are all banged up. Who knows if they're even going to get Randall back. The Bucks have all sorts of issues. My boss is going to have home court. Like they really should be playing in June in the finals. And uh, I kind of feel the same way with Denver where like you can say the West is better than it was last year. It sure is. Oklahoma city's good. They're young. They're fun. They're probably still too young and too small. And I don't know if I'll I trust would, the, yeah, the Nuggets ahead. would work the thunder in a playoff yes. series. Like that's just like the truth. I think if you're the thunder, you hope somebody else knocks out the nuggets. Then you beat whoever that team is. But and now Minnesota with towns no going cap, down, yes. we don't know how long that's going to be. I think Minnesota is like kind of a brutal matchup for Denver. Uh, I believe it was Zach Lowe said um, like whether it was like off the cuff or like uh, not that like someone came out and said it, but like sources had said that like the Timberwolves were the toughest them. matchup for Denver in last year's playoffs. So I, I've always thought of that. Like maybe Minnesota is a tricky matchup for them with their like jumbo lineups. that could maybe give some teams some issues. Um, but now with Towns hurt, that probably throws another wrench in this. And like Golden State, no, Lakers, no, Suns, definitely no, Dallas, no. Like you're running out of teams really quickly that could really give this team a run. So like it's, I'm more confident in Denver finding a way than I, honestly, I am Boston even with their talent advantage. Cause I just think that they don't have, they don't have the mid series adjustments that a Jokic can provide you. Yeah. And if they ever got knocked out second, third round, I mean, I guess if you got to a finals and you lost to Jokic, you say, you know what, That's you can't really destroy him for that. But man, anything short of that, I don't know what you do because Tatum and Brown are kind of set there. I don't know because you change the coach again, but just seems like they're stuck. And if they can't get over the hump this year and at least get to a finals and be competitive, I, I don't know where you what you do going forward. Yeah, that would be that would make for an interesting offseason because they just signed Jalen Brown to that Supermax contract. And I mean... You know what? You're not getting rid of Tatum, obviously, and like you, you got right. Drew Holiday here, you got Porzingis, so like you have a pretty ready-made team. But you know, at a, at a point, is Tatum or Brown are they going to take that next step to enter the the Jokic? Not no, that's an exaggeration. Not necessarily the Jokic tier, but you know, a, a thing below that to right. really contend for a finals. Like I don't know. Reed, you're the best man. Let everyone know where they could find your stuff. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Reed Wallach, just my name. Uh, read my work over at BetSide. I tweet out a bunch of stuff with uh, my links to my best bets for the day, a lot of like historical analysis that I like to do. And uh, yeah, follow my podcast at The Early Read, wherever you listen to them. And uh, yeah, new episodes uh, weekly for the tournament. Going to be a lot more. I'm going to be doing every day game previews, game handicaps, uh, you know, Thursday through Sunday on those games. So uh, yeah, make sure you're tuned in uh, this March. All right, man. Appreciate you coming on the best time of the year, man. Enjoy it. All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. All right. That will do it. Thank you to Reed Wallach. We will be back Monday as we get closer and closer to this tournament. We will have everything covered uh, as March Madness approaches. So talk to you guys Monday. Appreciate listening. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe. See you Monday.